Hello Swifties, welcome back to my channel. I am the Swiftologist, my name is Zach, and I am a journalist by trade and a Swiftie by choice. And today I am going to be doing my long anticipated, long overdue reaction, review, analysis of Miss Americana, the Netflix documentary about Taylor Swift released in early 2020. A cursed documentary for a cursed year. Now, you might be wondering why I'm wearing this shirt that washes me out so much. Well, because it contains the title, Miss Americana, of something that spiritually washes me out, which is watching this documentary. Now, I've only seen it like four times, I want to say, in total. And I want to preface this analysis and in-depth review by saying that on this channel, Swiftologist, where I talk about Taylor Swift and other pop culture related topics that are of interest to me, I like to take a really critical and analytical view of all of the media that I consume. So if you are a Swifty who stumbled upon my channel and you're looking for someone to say, yes, queen, she is the best person of all time, no matter what she says or does. And by she, I mean the blondie herself, Miss Taylor Swift. If you're expecting overly positive and uh, congratulatory feedback 24 seven, this is not the channel for you. If you are interested in having thoughtful, uh, analytical conversations about Taylor Swift as a cultural figure, then you might like the Taylor Swift content that I post here. So I wanna give that important disclaimer because I think a lot of people get lost and then they find my channel and they become enraged. I am a long-term Swifty. I'm a veteran. I've been around since like 2008. I have met Taylor several times and I am also a journalist. So that is the perspective that I am coming at from when I am analyzing and talking about Taylor Swift. To my returning subscribers, hello, nice to see you. I hope that we're all excited for the Midnight's content that we are about to receive from one Miss Taylor Swift. I have no idea what it's going to be, but I am so excited. And I can't wait to kick off release week with this fun overdue video. I really wanted to fulfill your guys' requests because I know you've been waiting patiently for this for a long time. Also, if you have not checked out my podcast, The Evolution of a Snake, we are finally getting to the infamous 2016 episode. So we go year by year through Taylor Swift's career and discuss the ins and outs in incredible detail of Taylor Swift's life as a pop star and as a human being. So we're just getting to the chaotic mess of a year that is 2016. And that is kind of tangentially related to the stuff that we discover in Miss Americana. So what do I want to talk about today with Miss Americana? Now, I think that Miss Americana is an interesting celebrity documentary in that it is not really a documentary. It is a puff piece. It is a uh, promotional tool that kind of coincided with the release of Lover and Taylor's rebranding as a politically conscious young activist slash pop star. I don't think that this was a particularly honest or revealing documentary. The celebrity documentary genre is kind of hard to pin down exactly because especially when you're documenting a living subject, it can be very difficult to ask questions that are objective or that maybe the profile or the interviewee doesn't want to hear. And my main criticism of Miss Americana is that Taylor Swift is clearly the director and producer. Lana Wilson is allegedly the director of this documentary, but her presence is like not really seen or felt throughout the film. And I think that that really contributes to this feeling that it's just Taylor showing you exactly what she wants you to see and really nothing further beyond that. There are a lot of moments in this documentary where if I was directing it as a director, I would think my job would be to push farther, to ask harder questions or to go deeper into these trains of thoughts and neuroses that do emerge from time to time throughout the documentary. Taylor is a particularly tricky person to profile because she's extremely media trained and very prone to rewriting the historical record to support whatever narrative she's peddling at the time. And that's totally okay and within her right to do so. But I feel as though the marketing for this documentary was a little bit disingenuous. And I don't think Think that we really learned anything new or specific about Taylor that we didn't know before bar one or two specific things where I felt she was quite brave and very candid about her experience and yet still I would have liked to push her to take it a little bit further in those moments so I guess we can just watch it together and I will tell you how I feel about specific things going on I think overall though my overarching thoughts is that Miss Americana is kind of a snooze it's boring there's not a lot of new information I feel like if you're new to Taylor Swift as an artist maybe Maybe this would be a good place to start. But also, I think that this documented period was not her strongest suit. It was not a time when she was being really her most fruitful, creative, or authentic self. So 
maybe it isn't a great place to start if you have no idea about her whatsoever. But I feel like I should just get straight into it. And before I do, I want to remind you to subscribe to my channel because we are almost at 10,000 subscribers. I'm so excited. Can't wait to see where this channel will go. The sooner we get to 10K, the sooner you guys get to see the reaction video of me watching me for the first time. As we all know, I hate that song and it terrorizes me to this day. And I'm going to have to listen to it and talk about it today. So this is, I'm doing a public service right now. This is very difficult behavior for me to do. Okay, so she's going through the old diaries. Says, my life, my career, my... Okay, so right off the bat, what are we getting? We're getting some promo. This is literally promo for the Lover Diaries that came out with Lover in 2019. Now, I know that this wasn't re released contemporaneously with Lover coming out, but... I mean, when we're starting off from this position, this position of something that she has, you know, recently sold or excavated or gone through, those diaries also did not reveal very much to us at all. I just, I don't know, Taylor Swift Diaries hoax 2022. Mm -hmm. You know, my entire moral code as a kid and now is a need to be thought of as it was all I wrote about, it was all I wanted, it was the complete and total. Yeah belief system. We are kind of positioning the narrative that we're going to follow with the documentary in this opening scene. Taylor is talking about her good girl complex, which is something that I have documented extensively on our podcast, The Evolution of Snake. This is the rudder of her life. It is her moral compass. It's what guides her through and helps her make decisions. Is this pursuit of being a good person, her need to be liked, her need to be applauded. I'm still on that tightrope. I'm still trying everything to keep you laughing at me. I mean, her need to be liked and to receive acclaim from all corners in her life is a very interesting, conceit to set up. I also think that she is deliberately positioning herself as sympathetic here. It's important to remember that Miss Americana was following a period of kind of very difficult press time that Taylor had had. Although in the two years prior to this coming out, it had kind of turned around. Sitting there in dungarees and a pink sweater with her cat on the piano, going through her diaries, talking about how she always wanted to be a good girl is a clever way to set up a sympathetic approach to a documentary, right? Like we're perceiving her as young, as naive, as innocent, as maybe even an unwilling participant in all of this like crazy fame game all she wanted to do was be good and write good songs and be a good girl and while I think that like her good girl complex is extremely evolved do I think that it's as straightforward as every single fumble that has been made in her career stems back to her wanting to be a good girl which is a pure intention that has absolutely no like personal responsibility attached to it. No, I don't buy that. I don't think that it's true, but I do agree that this is the rudder that like has driven her life. I am obsessed with the behind the scenes snippets of tour. I love seeing her backstage. I love seeing her put her little hood up and get out on that stage and slay. It's really good. I love it. Very hard and rare to see these moments. Amazing. Up next, we have a contrasting shot from her being a superstar celebrity performing a concert to getting into a car and being alone in the quiet and really appreciating this moment and feeling happy that she had it. I like the directorial choice here of switching scenes and kind of emphasizing how much of Taylor's time she spends isolated, alone, in enclosed spaces with a very few amount of people in contrast to what she does as a public figure. I think it's interesting to see that this is the way that she moves through the world and it's very revealing later on that her private moments are spent like this. She's not like one of the people. She's not amongst the crowd. She can't be, it's not practical for her. But I really like this following sequence that we get where she is in the car. All right, we've reached Grammy nomination day and this is the call that she gets from her publicist, Tree Pain, about her potential Grammy nominations for her 2017 album, Reputation. <gasps> Queen Meredith? Meredith, of course, is the emotional support cat, even though she's known to attack and savage people. It's, um, this is she good. is really not okay with this, clearly. Yeah. This is, you know what, like this- Girl, is it though? Yeah. I just need to make a better- Mm, and you made love her. <laughs> I can't deal with this. I hate, I hate this, this segment. Oh my God, nope, cannot. I won't do it. Stop, <laughs> please spare me, this is torture. I cannot believe that the segue from Reputation, which was objectively a good album and better than the album that followed it, the segue between I want to make a better album so that I can get nominated for a Grammy then cuts straight to her writing the 2019 song, Me, capital letters, exclamation point, featuring Brendan Urie. Like the jokes 
write themselves. I don't need to laugh about it. Making better music, writing the song me. One of those things is not like the other. I can't, the fact that she's trying to make it look like a really serious, thoughtful process. Girl, girl, you are sitting there trying to come up with the words, me, he, he, who, 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 and acting like you have written or unraveled the Da Vinci Code. I mean, girl, come on. This documentary just constantly makes me ask myself, what was she thinking? What the fuck was she thinking? It sounds different than I thought it Yeah, it sounds bad. Sounds sadder? sadder? No, badder. Worse. I don't know. I don't have any idea. It's really cool. You like it? Yeah. This man lied to her several times and told her that this song was hot, sexy, beautiful, and fly, and it is nothing like that. It's nothing of the sort. I can, this is why Joel Little never got hired again, Post Lover, because all the Joel Little songs that came out, You Need to Calm Down, Miss Americana, me, none of them were received well. He did not get the invitation to collaborate on a real record for Folklore Evermore or even Midnight's For All We Know because he flopped. And this is another issue that I have with Taylor from around this time. Every single person in her orbit in this documentary, except for those like old white men that talked to her about politics later, just seem to be confirming whatever it is that she brings to them. She is surrounded by yes men. And that is like not a good creative condition to be in when she's being challenged or like pushed out of her skill set or her comfort zone. That's when Taylor makes her greatest work. And when she's just being told that everything she does is fabulous and amazing, we get songs like me. I think this is the first single. <laughs> the fact that she wrote the words, I'm the only one of me, baby, that's the fun of me. And she hears a drum sample and goes, that's the first single, baby. No, <laughs> no. The first single is your first offering to the album that is supposed to be better than reputation and win you a Grammy or get you a Grammy nomination. And you think that me, he, he, who, who, who is going to get you there. I just, none of this makes sense to me. And how can you even deem a single as the first single before you've even written the fucking song? That doesn't make any sense to me. You got to get the body of work, trim it down and select the songs. And then you figure out the first single. You don't just write some jingle and decide that that's going to be the first offering from a new record cycle. I mean, honestly, it was delusional hours around this. Okay, so something that Lana Wilson repeatedly said when she was doing press for this documentary was how astounded she was by watching Taylor create in real time and seeing how fast she could come up with stuff. And it's like, I, I totally agree. Other producers have said the same thing, but the evidence that she captured to support this crucial point was this clip. Her saying, wow, we just wrote a whole verse and a chorus of shit, of garbage, of nonsense. I mean, you know, Lana Wilson, you did not do your job right. And Taylor Swift, you shouldn't have let her do it. So, and Joel Little, you're also in trouble. Everybody's fucking fired. Oh, Andrea, I love Mama Swift so much. She is an angel. It's really interesting to see her in a business conference setting, like to see her being the HBIC making these decisions. That's a look behind the curtain that we don't get very often. And I'm kind of sad that there was only a very short clip of it included in the documentary. Okay. The following sequence is like a lot of found footage. And that's kind of another problem that I have with Miss Americana is that there's not a lot of original footage that is not recorded by Taylor herself in this. Like the talking head moments that we get with Lana and Taylor and a camera alone together are very few and they're very short and they're about a very select number of topics. There is so much found footage like of things that were filmed in prior past situations or by Taylor herself that is kind of narrated over by this voiceover, obviously written by Taylor Swift. I just wonder like, where is the directorial role coming in here? Like just selecting the footage to go along with the monologue that Taylor has written. Like there is no opportunity for dialogue here. And that's why I think this documentary suffers because it really exists in a vacuum. It's like Taylor decided that this was what she wanted to say and this is how she wanted to say it and we received it. And I'm totally good with that when it comes to contexts like listening to her records or reading interviews with her or if she writes an essay, I would love to read that. The way that this feature was billed was as something that was very vulnerable and a very behind the curtains look at Taylor Swift. And that is only maybe eight to 10% of this entire documentary. The rest of it is like, pre-deemed acceptable footage and thoughts and workshopped ideas. 
And I think that some of the stuff that she does allow Lana Wilson to capture actually doesn't end up reflecting her in a very good light. And that's the whole point, I think, of allowing a camera crew access to your life is to show you as a three-dimensional human being. And I think that Taylor is really trying to come across a certain way in this. If you're just looking to like feel close to her and feel proud of her and not question anything she's ever done in her life and just agree that she is the biggest slay queen and she's never done anything wrong, then you know this is the, this is the movie for you. But it's not for me. I don't think I would have such a problem with this if it wasn't billed in a different way. Like I just think that it's false advertising. And she's practicing what I like to call strategic vulnerability. I've mentioned this a couple times on my channel. Taylor is rightfully selective about what information she wants to share and how deep into it she wants to go. That is totally fine with me. I just think that even the strategic vulnerability, which is like calculated and put forth in a very specific way is few and far between in this documentary. It's a lot of like ruminating and summarizing and not a lot of like processing and going through emotions in real time. This would have been a much more interesting documentary had it, bit, had it been filmed over a period of time where she was currently experiencing something difficult. The central tension of this documentary seems to be her coming to grips with being a Democrat. And I understand that that was a big thing for her, but Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to wait and get into that later. We're going to get into the scenes where she talks about Taylor Swift's over party and Snake Gate, because what is a Taylor Swift retrospective if it doesn't include this story? It was so echoey in there. At the time, I didn't know they were booing him doing that. This for sure is super interesting as well. And I remember when this came out and I watched it for the first time, I thought that it was a real paradigm shift to know that she thought that everybody was booing her in that moment. And that in fact, she did not deserve the awards and the accolades that she was receiving at that time, which goes on to explain so much about why she constantly sought Kanye West's approval and approval and acclaim in general. It was kind of baked into her that she was not good enough when she had all of her formative traumatic experiences as a child being bullied in school. I would say that that was her real formative experience, not this specific specific moment in time, although this definitely reinforced something that I think she has felt throughout her life. I just don't know that framing this Kanye dilemma through that lens specifically is nuanced enough to account for all the different reasons that went into the Taylor Swift is over party. It was not simply about her being lied on and about this feud that had been building up over time that was one-sided. There were multiple things that Taylor had been doing around that time that engendered a sense of mistrust or not a lot of goodwill from the general public towards her that had nothing to do with Kanye West or anything that he had done or any sort of way that he had twisted her words. In 2016, when everything came crashing down around her, there was a lot more color and texture to be added to the story that I think that the Taylor Swift is over party would have happened with or without Snakegate. She was careening towards an overexposure and a moment of backlash, whether she liked it or not. Ultimately, I think that this was actually a humbling experience for her and it has allowed her to move forward with her career in a way that is more detached and more professional and allows her to keep something to herself in terms of her private life. Um, we'll get into to that later, but we do cover this extensively in our 2016 episode of The Evolution of Snake, which I keep plugging, but it's just very relevant to what we're talking about right now. That was like sort of a catalyst for psychological, not all of them were beneficial. Like, I can't change what's going to happen but I can control what- Now this sense of control being mentioned before we pop straight into the 2016 Grammys is very interesting to me. Taylor can control what she writes. And I understand the way that she is laying this up in the sense that she felt like she didn't belong. And therefore she felt that she had to make the absolute best work possible in order to feel that she had accomplished something in her life. And I think the part of this that's being left out and where I think a director could have come in and asked her a question instead of letting her do a voiceover in this moment would have been to ask her, okay, so did that sense of control extend beyond your craft? Did it extend into your personal life? And how did it affect the way that you conducted your life as a public figure? Because her sense of control like absolutely went further than just writing her own songs. During the 1989 era, she was pretty retaliatory towards journalists that wrote negatively about her. And she also tried to kind of jump in front of stories before they took off in an effort to calm them down or stop them from running away with themselves. And Taylor really is a person that initiates a Streisand effect a lot of the time. And if you don't know what the Streisand effect is, Barbara Streisand insisted to Google Maps that they take down an overhead su surveillance video of her house in California. Nobody had really been looking for Barbara Streisand's house before she pointed it out and made a big deal and tried to you know, pursue legal action against Google. And once they did, everybody started looking for it and examining her house and invading her privacy. Taylor did 
did this a lot of the times. She would go out of her way to aggressively shut down a story or a train of thought or a narrative before it got ahead of itself. And sometimes with those situations, she brought more attention to it than there would have been in the first place. Most recently, I'm thinking of the Ginny and Georgia Netflix show, which honestly made no splash whatsoever. Nobody was really watching that show or caring about it. There was a throwaway, very benign, not nice, but very benign comment about Taylor in that documentary. And she tweeted about it and made it a whole thing. So again, she magnifies certain things by responding. And I think that her, her sense of control that she feels she must have over her public image really has served to feed this narrative that she is controlling or calculated. And I think that if she was more forthcoming about the fact that she finds it hard to let things be as they are in every sense of the word, then people would perceive her a little bit more authentically. Okay, I'm gonna have to skip through a lot of the following sequence because it has a lot of copyrighted music and I am not trying to get a strike. Lana and Taylor, the co-directors of this documentary, are laying up the 1989 sleigh. They're referencing a bunch of really amazing reviews that it had, a New York Times review that I love and revisit all the time that said that Taylor Swift is aspiring to a mode of pop that no one else can ever even get at, a timelessness per se. And they're setting up this big success and how 1989 was a huge moment for her and how when she got to the 2016 Grammys, she looked around and felt that her her life was pretty empty. Oh my God, that we wanted. That was all. Now this is some interesting tea. I want to thank the fans for the last 10 years. And now I want to point out something here. Do you see how as soon as she starts her acceptance speech for album of the year at the Grammys, they cut away immediately. They fade out the audio and they get into woe is me, I felt like there was nobody there that I had been able to climb the mountain with. And I felt that I had to chase a bunch of acclaim and success in order to feel worthy and valued. What they didn't mention here, because they're building up to Snake Gate, I think this is relevant. What they didn't mention here is that Taylor devoted her entire speech for album of the year to comment or clap back at Kanye West. And the speech is an extremely uncomfortable one because it basically like overrides the deserved acclaim and success that 1989 had warranted over a year and a half album campaign in favor of responding to something that really could have been not as big of a deal had she just chosen not to respond to it. So this is what I'm talking about with the Streisand effect. By mentioning it in her album of the year Grammy speech, which was already controversial because there was another record by Kendrick Lamar called To Pimp a Butterfly that was argued to be more culturally impactful than 1989 in an important or social justice and movement way, because she called attention to something so petty and vindictive in this moment that was supposed to be celebratory and was supposed to prove to the world, like she said, that she was worthy and deserving of being there, she set herself up for a backlash. Now, I'm not saying that she deserved it or that she did it to herself, but she contributed to it. And by doing things like fading out of the Grammy speech and not fully interrogating this sense of control that she has to have over her entire life, Lana Wilson and Taylor Swift are revising the historical record and making it something that it wasn't. And I didn't have a partner that I climbed, but I just, shouldn't I have someone that I could call right now? You should. And the fact that you were fully in a relationship with Calvin Harris at this time, and you did not feel like you could call him. I mean, they weren't going to break up for another three or four months after this. I mean, it just adds a layer of tea that I love, that it's delicious. I mean, it's, it's the getaway car prelude, you know, she never felt truly connected to him or like that was a real relationship for her. Again, deep dive into Taven and that whole situation with some really juicy tea that I had forgotten about on the evolution of a snake coming soon. This is one of my favorite scenes because this is the kind of behind the scenes access that I want. And I feel like Taylor talks about something really interesting here that I wish Lana Wilson would have pushed back on and addressed. Definitely not ready to have kids. Definitely interesting. Not ready for all this grown, up. grown up stuff. You are 29 years old, ma'am. You're grown up. It happens. I kind of don't figuring stuff out because my life is planned like in time. Mm. Like literally in two so months still come compelling. Down. This is so interesting for me. And I also think like a contributing reason as to why the Taylor Swift is over party gave Taylor some much needed, I guess, clarity because it forced her to take a break in that two year album cycle where she basically was on a treadmill. Like she literally just could not get off of it. It was album tour, album tour, album promo, short break tour. It's true. I think it would be very hard to gain any sort of like sense of adultness or independence in this world when you have other people creating your schedule and telling you exactly where and when you need to be and for how long you need to be there for. It's it's hard. It's grueling. Also, this is interesting because I do wonder if um, Taylor was planning on doing a full tour for Lover. It seems as though she was intending on doing that at the time. Keep in mind, this was way before the album came out. The following scene is another one of my favorites. It's her and Andrea getting on a plane and eating food together. So... So yeah, 
It's so weird to see her just in the wild. She's like that Lady Gaga meme. Bus, club, plane, another club. It's plane, car, studio, plane, car, apartment. I love the 13 embossed on the leather seats of the airplane. Kitty, I've met this dog. It's crazy. It's really lovely to hear Andrea speak and to see her interacting with Taylor. I mean, if you've seen them in person at concerts or like at meet and greets like I have or at the secret session, they are so close like they really truly you can tell they have an incredible mother-daughter bond and Taylor just really seems to fully relax whenever she's in her presence and like her eye goes straight to Andrea whenever they're in any room there's that funny video if you've seen of them getting into an elevator and Taylor being like mom mom where's mom like freaking out they're like truly joined at the hip and I mean whether or not that's good for her psychologically I'm not a hundred percent sure but it is sweet to see and it makes the news of Andrea's illness so upsetting and hard to swallow and I can't imagine trying to deal with that while also trying to rule the world and I wonder if you know that that illness was announced in 2015 I want to say right before 1989 came out or during the promo cycle for it and I do wonder if you know Taylor's incessant grip on trying to control everything in her life also kind of stemmed from that, that one thing that, you know, Taylor Swift has all the resources and the access to the best treatment and the best everything in the world. But unfortunately, there are some things that money truly can't buy and good health is one of those things. Dog. She's actually, that's a good yeah. Well, that's what it is. Happy that worked out for you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry but, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's good to see that they can laugh about it and make light of it. She got cancer several years ago. That has been Really it's so clear when you see them that this is true. She, it woke me up from this, this mm -hmm. life where I used to sweat all these things. This is the Nashville house where I met Taylor Swift. Uh, isn't that fun? You gotta be able to really prioritize what matters to you. For sure. We can definitely see and that she's made a conscious family. effort to focus more on and that. Okay, so the next scene, we are going to be in Taylor's Nashville apartment. Like this was the scene of so many of my dreams and imaginations of meeting Taylor when I was like 14 or 15. I really wanted to be invited like for lunch or something to her apartment. I love this apartment. It is objectively like strange looking it's decorated in a very interesting way but it is such a time capsule relic to an earlier version of taylor this like independent just moved to nashville still whimsical still romantic but trying to learn how to be an adult when she was really obsessed with antiquing and kind of like warm fall pastelish colors as well you can see that this apartment is extremely eclectic and here she is in the apartment with queen noted character in the taylor swift universe Abigail, and they are having a glass of wine and a meal and discussing how Taylor is not ready to be an adult human being that gets married and has children just yet. They sleep. Yeah. You feed them. You do it all over. You change them. They yeah. sleep. You feed them. Like, she's, she's and I'm like, what is this? Millennial behavior. It's like a Tamagotchi, girl. I think you would be an excellent mother. Thanks. I agree. She would be an excellent mother. Look at this apartment. I'm obsessed with it. Here's another snippet at how insane her life is and how sheltered she is from the world. Well, good luck selling this picture. How is this person supposed to have any perspective when she is living her life hiding from the world like this? It's hard. It's hard. This is one of my favorite scenes of documentary just because it's so weird and it really lays up Taylor's problem. The screaming. All those people standing outside her house. What do they think is going to happen? And the silence. Isn't that crazy? That's your house. That's where you live. So the next scene is probably the most compelling moment in the documentary, in my opinion. And this is where Taylor talks about her relationship to her body and her body image issues. I want to give a trigger warning for anybody who is triggered by eating disorder related content, because this might be uncomfortable for you to watch. To get triggered by something, whether it's a picture of me where I feel like I looked like my tummy was too big or or like someone said that mm -hmm. I looked pregnant or something. It must be very difficult actually. Something and that'll just trigger me to just starve a little bit, just stop eating. Honestly, this is heartbreaking to me. I thought that I was just like supposed no, to feel baby, like I was no. gonna pass out at the end of a show or in the middle of it. I thought that was how it was. I'm a size six instead of a size double zero. I mean, that 
that wasn't how my body was supposed to be. I so just true. Didn't really understand that at the time. I really. I agree with her. I don't it. think she was aware that this was a problem. I, I know a lot of the time I say that like don't extend grace to like rich and famous people. Like they have everything, but this is one of those things where. I think that unrelenting body image standards, particularly for female celebrities, are really damaging psychologically. And especially for someone like Taylor Swift, who being skinny was like kind of part of her brand for a really long time. It was being this kind of dainty, elegant, whimsical girl, all centered around her naivete, her innocence and her smallness and her youthfulness, which are all things that we morally attach to thinness. We have a lot of emotional relationships with the states that our bodies exist in and we project those things onto other people and i think that for taylor this was really when she says that she was not aware that she was doing it at the time i truly believe that she wasn't aware but i do think that there is a piece missing in this testimony that she's giving about this obviously this is her journey and her story so it's not like for me to say how she should talk about it or should have conducted it but I think that the way that she's presented it is as something that she could just kind of like shift her mindset on and it would get better. And I think that that, that might work for some people, that might be true for some, but for the large majority of people, there an, an intervention of some sort, be it through therapy or some other means is necessary. And I, I Taylor is totally within her rights to keep that to herself. But I would, I would hope that she has received some sort of like professional help in that capacity. I don't think that she has because she said publicly that she's never seen a therapist before, but it's clear that her relationship to her body has changed. There has been some discussion as of late about whether she is still maintaining this mindset, and I don't want to speculate on that in public. I really just don't think that that's appropriate, but it is important and I think pretty major that she mentioned this in the documentary because for years subconsciously by not saying that you work really hard to make your body look like that even though you don't say it what you're communicating is that it's natural or that it's easy or that you know people's bodies do just kind of naturally look that way and that's always an argument that people who are, are sick or suffering from an eating disorder might make is i think that my body is just meant to look this way i don't need to eat as much or i don't feel the need and i think that taylor pointing out that that is just not true and that allowing her body to sit more comfortably at a weight that it feels natural to be at while nourishing herself and doing all of the things that she did before like touring but in a better capacity has significantly improved her life. I think that's a really important thing for her to say, given how many legions of young women and young people she has in her fan base. Mm -hmm. And like, I just caught myself yesterday to start to do it and I was like, do that anymore because it's better to look, to think you look anymore. And you just, we're just, we're changing the channel in our brain and we're not, not doing that anymore. So this is another moment where I think a little bit of directorial intervention or to at least hear Lana Wilson's voice asking her questions behind the camera because that's all been edited out as though Taylor's just giving these like lengthy vlog moments almost to the camera directly. I think if Lana had pushed in and asked like, okay, how did you get to a place where you were able to change the channel in your brain? Because as I mentioned before, I think for a lot of people, for most, and I'm sure for Taylor as well, it's not as simple as waking up one day and saying, we're not doing that anymore, we're moving on. A good director would probe her a little bit and maybe get a little bit more information about how exactly she came to this conclusion and whether or not this is still an issue that she deals with to this day. A lot of the problems and tensions that were presented within Miss Americana are past things, things that we've gotten over, things that no longer trouble us, but once did before and now we see the light and we have all the wisdom and the knowledge and can move beyond that. It would be more compelling as a documentary that portrayed a three-dimensional human being to maybe discuss things that she's still struggling with now or to understand more in depth how her past struggles have contributed to the way that she is today and what kind of things she carries with her on a daily basis. In this little package that they've put together for us of all these interviews and clips, they are setting up the various backlashes that Taylor has received throughout her career. And I think the main one that they go on to address um, and that she's also addressed ad nauseum is that she was uh, unrightfully slut shamed for many years simply for dating around, for dating guys. And she was put in an impossible situation where basically anything she did was criticized. Now, there are a couple of things in here that are not addressed because they don't paint Taylor in a particularly flattering light. Something that I think was a main contributor to the Taylor Swift is over party and Snake Gate in general was this empty corporate 
brand of feminism that she sold to the world and the friends that she collected along the way that were obviously not authentic friends of hers. They were fair weather friends, as she mentioned in Reputation, that she used for a purpose. And that purpose was to sell a specific brand of feminism that would increase her visibility in the public eye and help her sell more records. And I think that that contributed to the sense of inauthenticness and disingenuousness that was the driving force behind the Taylor Swift is fake, Taylor Swift is over party. That girl squad thing was something that I think really, um, by collecting all of these model beautiful friends and hanging out with skinny girls and posting about it all day long, a lot of people felt left out, triggered, or in other ways put off by that. And Taylor has addressed that kind of in interviews. As a documentary, this is the place where really we should be getting into these issues, understanding how she felt about them, understanding how she learned from this mistake. She's touched on this very briefly, but when you're gonna go through a formative event like the Taylor Swift is over party, and you're not gonna analyze the contributing factors or the role that you yourself played in it, it's hard to get a full understanding of what's going on. And that's what this documentary is billed as, an understanding of who Taylor Swift is and where she is at this moment in her life and I think that it's incomplete. Celebrity feuds. Kanye West recently dissed Taylor in his new song, Famous. All right, so now we are getting into the snake gate debacle, the whole aftermath of the phone call when it was released. This really started in February of 2016, right after the Grammys, because the hashtag Taylor Swift is over party was just a small portion of the backlash. And it is the one I think that Taylor harkens back to a lot because this is the easiest one to say I had no part in this, especially because she's since been vindicated and it's been proven that a lot of what happened in that phone call was edited and cleverly manipulated to make her look more culpable than she was. But exposing only this part of it in this documentary allows her to abdicate any sense of responsibility for this backlash that she received. And it is in my opinion that she contributed to it as well. Mm. Yes. Hashtag Taylor Swift okay. is over party was the number one. Good enough. And I've been doing this for 15 years. And I, the time. I really empathize with her here. The... It's hard to see her cry. It just feels like it's more than music now. At this yeah, point. for sure. And just most, it just gets loud. Yeah, it's very overwhelming to experience that level of backlash. There's nothing you can do to make them change their mind. They just don't love you anymore. Okay, another moment where we needed some directorial intervention or some context being laid up. She's in a meeting with her mom and her business managers, who we later go on to see in the scene where she is crying and talking about how she wants to come out as a Democrat and everybody is warning her about the potential commercial impact that will have on her career. How did she get to a point where she was this upset and talking about wanting to disappear and go away and feeling like she'd been doing this for too long and it was too hard for her to deal with? How did we get to this point? Like, we don't understand what context the camera is entering this conversation at. Like, what point did this start? How did, what was the triggering event that made Taylor feel this way? Was it something to do with an article or some bad press that came out? Were they trying to anticipate more of the future consequences from coming out as a Democrat? Like, the context would really be important here. This is an extremely short clip that addresses something that was very pivotal and very um, laid up as the central conflict of this documentary, but we have no context for how it came up and what specific event they are referencing in this moment. And I think that it would be helpful for us to see the director ask some questions or give us a little bit of backstory as to how exactly we got to this heated moment. There was no buildup. We just got straight to the breaking point and it does not get explained. So it's confusing to me. I just wanted to disappear. So again, we see that example of strategic vulnerability. She's showing us that she's been upset and she's been affected by it, but she doesn't really want to let us in and tell us exactly what triggered this moment or how exactly she's processing these emotions right now, as opposed to in hindsight. And I think that, yep, strategic vulnerability, you're totally entitled to do it, but then don't build this as a tell-all documentary, because it ain't. All right, so now we are backstage of the Reputation Tour. She is wrapping it up. And she's going to see her boyfriend, Joe Alwyn, and give him a hug. Again, he's very private and their relationship is private, so he's not really featured at all. I think it's good that we get to see 
that he is important to her and to see some capacity of their interaction. What would have been cool in this moment would have been to have her elaborate or pontificate a little bit on the lessons that she's learned from making her relationships public and living her life in the public eye. Why is she doing this differently? Why is it important for her to protect her privacy? Uh, she could definitely go into all of that without violating this new sense of secrecy and privacy that she wants to keep around her relationship. Again, a director should have asked a question. Taylor Swift should have written a note in her voiceover, but she's not going to do that automatically because she's the subject, right? She wants to keep her cards close to her chest. As the director, your job is to toe that line and to push her a little bit farther than maybe she wants to be pushed in pursuit of the truth. And I'm not seeing much truth here. Okay, so we're back in hell. Brandon Urie is here now, the most annoying person in the world. You guys think you're doing something. Another like me, he, he. I hate it. Like, I just want like little kids to be like, there's no one like me. Why? Are you a children's artist? Are you trying to make a kids' bop album? Are you planning to star as the new Barney on the Barney show? Why are you trying to appeal to children? Why do you want children to listen to your music? You are 29 years old. You are an adult artist. What is this? You can't have it both ways. Either make a kids' bop album or make a serious record. Do not bait and switch me. Not in this circumstance. <laughs> yeah, I had a crazy dude break into my oh, this is a really scary part of her life okay another moment that we just gloss over and something that taylor has talked about a couple of times in terms of the drawbacks of being a public figure she constantly is dealing with threats to her life she literally carries uh medical grade gauze like wound gauze in case somebody gets shot in front of her this is a really animating scary feature of her life and also adds to the the insular nature and the shelteredness of her existence I just think that, you know, the director should have asked her more questions about what this does to her psychologically. And she is, you know, given very brief answers here. Very brief answers. He is the most annoying person in the world. I'm serious. <laughs> the fact <laughs> these bitches be tripping. What? the hell he just screamed into a microphone and it sounded horrible and they're saying it sounds amazing i mean this video is just turning into me hating me all day long um i'm just gonna skip through the next because i literally cannot stand to go through the creation of the me music video and taylor just like thinking that she is a genius for creating this because it was not the move it was not the move okay so the next plot point in the film and kind of the animating theme that ties it all together unfortunately is taylor's just political awakening now a political awakening, I suppose, is always a welcomed advancement in any person's life. However, it is of my personal opinion that pop stars are not activists and they are not elected representatives and they are not politicians. And having them weigh in constantly on issues that are serious, that affect people's lives, that they are maybe not entirely informed upon, has contributed to a sense of ridiculousness and absurdity and theatrical nature of politics as we know it in this day and age and i think that we would all be better served if we took the spectacle out of politics which is why i have always before taylor came out as a democrat i always really did not have a problem with her not explicitly stating her political affiliations that did not strike me as something that was problematic or that she was doing out of self-preservation or even to uh protect herself from criticism or to court a republican audience i really felt that she did it because she felt as though she did not know how to make a difference and whether her voice was needed and i say this in application to pretty much every pop star like they are our court jesters they're there to entertain us they're not there to educate us or inform us it's an added bonus i suppose that they do but i don't agree that it comes with the job description and i feel that taylor's swift turn into outing herself as a democrat which if we can be honest is not really a major thing to do for anyone other than taylor swift that is not a, a moment that registers as important or necessary to share with the world unless you live in a place where you are so beyond sheltered and out of touch from the rest of society that it strikes you as revolutionary or very impactful that you state that you vote for a specific party like it's i don't know Let's just watch and get into it. After this year, Marsha Blackburn has self-described hardcore. I think I'll be really upset if people. 
stand. See, this is where I think that like pop activism is really not helpful because what is this doing other than like painting Marsha Blackburn who as a villain or as someone to be reviled or hated or distrusted and Taylor Swift as a hero or a brave person for speaking out against her. Like how does that, I'm sure Marsha Blackburn is not a great person and I probably don't agree with her politics, but like I just don't see how painting the world in such black and white terms, good, bad, conservative, liberal, like associating morality with each either side. I just don't see how that's like the, that, I don't see how that has a place in a documentary about a pop star. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't think that it's appropriate content. And it's also not interesting when we've already skipped past all the stuff that we're actually naturally interested in about Taylor as a public figure. Many of us were not coming here to receive information about the state of politics. And also because it was such a small localized event, like this is immediately relevant, basically as soon as the documentary came out. And I think that Taylor's journey through to voicing her opposition against Marsha Blackburn was not as revolutionary as she thought it was and that's why this portion of the documentary was not received very well and received a lot of, of blowback and criticism throughout my whole career label executives and publishers would just say now this is interesting because she's getting into genre specific constraints expectations pressures placed upon you by higher beings i also want to make the point that like it is completely her right to choose how she wants to use her voice and to use her platform i'm not saying that she should be quiet and stay silent about any perceived injustice that she seems in the world if she wants to use her platform in any specific way like that is completely up to her free speech it's a free world she can do whatever she wants but what i don't like is when we approach these issues while we are also trying to rebrand ourselves while we're also trying to sell records, then to me, it doesn't seem that it's entirely coming from a good place, from a place of wanting to affect change. And this is why the pop star politic conversation is so complicated because it's like, they can't make any difference in a political arena without being a little bit narcissistic and calling attention to themselves and making it about them. And I feel as though that is what's off-putting about when pop stars get political. And I think that because Taylor is so calculated and she has exerted a lot of control over her career and her image and everything she does is very purposeful, people perceive her interventions in political matters as pretty pointedly calculated to benefit her, not as altruistic or uh, good intended statements. 51. As to how not to be shamed for something on it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you get accused of being calculated for having This is strategy. very interesting, actually. So then we get into what I would say is the final, like, stirring, interesting, compelling part of the documentary, which is her reflections on the sexual assault trial and the impact that it had upon her and also the influence that it played in making her want to speak out and talk more about how it is to be a woman in the entertainment industry. Been to me, this boss. They did an investigation. Yep, he as got he fired. Then he sued. Fucking crazy. Of dollars. So I slay. Honestly, this is where her flair for drama is really useful and important. Happens mm -hmm. to women. I was angry that people are paid. To Incredibly end. important point that she's making here. You don't feel a sense of any victory. Yeah, I believe that. Because the process is so dehumanizing. Yep. This is with it's seven really witnesses unique. and a photo. What happens when you get rid I think that this is one of the most effective, stirring, rousing, interesting moments of this documentary, where Taylor is not only making a point and making a commentary on the way the world works, but she's also acknowledging that the position that she has in this scenario and this situation is extremely unique and not applicable to the world at large. She's taking a moment and making it a point to not center herself while talking about this experience that happened to her because it revealed something larger to her about the world that led her to a realization. And I think that this is, again, one of the most interesting and compelling part of the documentary. <laughs> I guess I just think about all the people that weren't believed. This is beautiful. The See, this is a beautiful believed, moment. The people who are afraid to... This scene breaks my heart. Oh, taking this shit bag of shit they gave I love Andrea Swift so much. It's okay now. And I just thought to myself, next time there is any opportunity to change anything, you had better know what you stand for. So this is where I think it gets a little complicated. And again, the pop star politics thing is really tricky to navigate because 
she has laid it up for herself now after uh, making this statement about sexual assault and tying it to her Dixie Chicks fear and tying that to Marsha Blackburn. She's now kind of made it so that whenever there is a political event or something that she should be against or people think she should be for or against, she has allowed people to expect that she will respond or that she will do something or that she will say something. And the fact of the matter is there is always something going on. There is always a pressing, urgent issue that needs awareness and attention brought to it. And when you have a platform like that and you say that you're going to use it for specific purposes like this, people are going to start coming to you and wondering why you're not doing it every single time. It's a catch-22. It's an unfortunate situation to be in. I don't really have a suggestion as to how you can get out of it, other than that I think we need to collectively take the pressure off of celebrities and the responsibility away from them to dictate how we believe in things in this world. So now we're getting into the kerfuffle that Taylor got into with her team, who, again, we're not introduced to. Thanks, Lana. Thanks, Taylor. We're not introduced to them, how long they've been working for, what roles exactly they played with her, and also how they've interacted with her over time time because I think you'll see in the response that she has to them that there is clearly an existing dynamic here where she feels either like frustrated or not heard or has been told how to behave or taken advice from these people in the past. We don't really get that context, which would be really helpful in understanding the full picture of the situation. My team's really not happy with me right now. It's not that I want mm -hmm. to step into this. I just, I, I can't. For 12 years, we've not got involved with politics. First of all, you're a British. Shut up. And also, back in the presidential election, I was in such she's a really place looking that I was like a child. Well, and imagine if we came to you and said, hey, we've got this idea that we could halve the number of people that come to you. Now I'm terrified. I'm the guy that went out and bought armor. This cars. is Scott Swift I speaking. Worry for her. It's fair pay for women. She votes against the reauthorization of the of the Violence Against Women Act, which is just basically protecting us from domestic abuse. And that's where, again, some context earlier, pushing on the stalking thing could have added a whole nother layer of depth and gravity to this documentary. Like I can get it and pick up on these things as I'm sure many of you can, but like, I think that the general public would have gotten a much better, fuller understanding of Taylor had we had more content. You forgive me for wow, and he's giving her a hug. He's being nice about it. All right, so another thing I wanna point out in this scene is like, this really reads as a 15 year old girl saying that She's going to go to the gay pride parade with her friends and she doesn't care if her dad wants her to go or not. She's going to go. And what I mean by that is that this this resistance that she's meeting and this like frustration, this kind of it's not immature to cry, but she really is kind of like lashing out the way that a teenage girl would this response and reaction that she's having to something that is actually fairly benign and the reaction that her team is having as well to have her commercial impact. Come on, coming out as a Democrat is not going to have the commercial impact that you built over a 15 year career. Please like give me a break. I think that this says something to us about how sheltered her world is and how limited her worldview is and how much of life she has not experienced and won't experience because of the way that she has to live purely based off of how famous she is. We also can see the good girl complex acting up here. Uh, please forgive me for what I'm about to do. It's all very like I'm a rebel and I'm doing something incredible and I'm doing something that's groundbreaking for me. And I think she expected a bigger response to it because it was so long overdue. But what she forgets is like, it's a big deal for you, but the world has moved on and the world has like got bigger and more pressing issues to worry about than whether or not you're a Democrat. All right, so now we're gonna get into the scene where she posts her Instagram oh, with Tree Payne, her publicist. And this is honestly just like political theater. This is this is silly at this point. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little nervous. Yeah, your job's on the line, babe. For everything we need to expect. Number yeah. one, the president will come after <laughs> Tea, you. legendary. Yes. Ladies, God help us all. To the resistance. the resistance. Do you see what I mean? This is very myopic. Love you, Taylor, but you are not the center of the universe. Okay, so then we get into basically Taylor being surrounded by her henchmen, her yes men, telling her how great she is and all the amazing things that she's accomplished since coming out as a Democrat, which, okay, we're not going to watch it because I really just don't think it's important or essential information. The female artists that I know of. That is so true. Themselves more on this, times more, more about what it's like to be a pop star. Most people can't speak to that. I don't know, like as I'm reaching through, this is probably one of my last opportunities to grasp onto that kind of 
That's so interesting. She was definitely like in a place of I'm going to retire after a lover. And I think that's why she went for like such a weird juvenile young theme was because she was scared that she was no longer going to be relevant anymore. So I guess she was trying her best to like really get down with the kids. But as we've seen with Folklore and Evermore, she's picked up a bunch of new fans, like young new fans. And Midnight's is, I really think, set to be another huge moment for her. And it's going to be much bigger than Lover was because Lover really did not make a splash in the way that she thought that it would and maybe the problem with lover is that she was like i have to do everything i ever wanted to do on this one album because it's my last chance maybe that's why she did this documentary and had all these like projections and expectations of how it was going to go that didn't align with how it actually ended up panning out maybe that's why but i'm glad to see now and confidently say that that's not true. That, this is not her last biggest moment that she will ever have. So then the documentary concludes with Taylor going to the VMAs and being so happy that she has like gotten so many signatures for the Equality Act after doing her song and dance with You Need to Calm Down. The uh, menace Todger Cole is featured quite heavily in this section, so I don't really care to get into it. Also, I don't like the ending because I think that it ties it up in such a like narrative conclusion. Like Taylor Swift is now a Democrat and she's made such a difference in this world and her new album is out now and won't you go buy it and isn't everything you ever thought about her negative not true now that you've seen all these rebuttals and it's like what was the point of this like, genuinely what was the point of this movie like I, I really just don't understand what she thought was going to happen and how she thought people were going to receive this which just goes to show that like being sheltered and the lover moment was not so good for her and I think the pandemic weirdly was a moment where she had to like get in touch with the people and see what the people were doing because we were all inside and we were all online we were all for the first time existing in like the public town square simultaneously you couldn't be like pretending that you were having this amazing incredible time at least for the first brief period of the pandemic so I think she got more in touch with like what people actually want from her and what people expect from her and what people like to see from her where I said this time it was like, this was major image rehab post Snake Gate and Taylor Swift's over party. So I'm sure there's going to be a Swiftologist's over party for all of the critical things I've said about Taylor. But if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Leave me a comment and let me know what you thought about Miss Americana and let me know how you're feeling about Midnight's coming out so soon. And make sure to subscribe and like this video, check out my podcast, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye, Swifty.